Hey everybody, this is Petey from the Spinner Rack, and this is my double back react video. I'm doing a react video on why the Dark Phoenix blew our minds from sci-fi sci -fi wire. Now, the double back react is from a friend of mine from college. His name was Damon, and um, uh, it was a you know, good friend. And, um, well, call, contact me. And this copyright is all his, but I just wanted to say that because, you know, such a great line. But anyway, I'm going to this sci-fi thing. I'm going to do a react to this video because there's some bits. It's a very good video. It's, you should check it out. It's got a lot of bits. It's got a lot of stuff from, I think it's explained to X-Men. It's got a lot of good bits in there. There's some things it's just it's got to add on, though, so it's like an addendum to it. So just adding a little more bits to it that we have to say because this is the X-Men, this is Jean, her history is long, and um, you know, what can we say? There's more to say. So I wanna quickly go through the video. I'm not gonna play everything, but I'm gonna try to go through all of it. So I'm checking on it right now. There are thousands of comics out there in the world, but every once in a while there is an issue, an arc, a miniseries that's absolutely incredible. Dark Phoenix? is one of those comics that blew our minds. Now, I just wanted to say that that's one of the best titles ever, and I wish I thought of it. Just want to keep that documented. You know, I've been watching all the sci-fi stuff, and they've been doing everything that we... <laughs> oh, I think um, Spinner Rack as a channel has wanted to do, but they've been able to do it a lot better. And a lot of successful, but we got some interviews, we got some comic book overviews, but you know, they're killing it right now. It's looking great. I'm glad they went to the fan and comic side, but let's keep watching. Oh, no, no, let's not. Oh, this is going to give us a quick overview of things getting into Marvel. So maybe I'll let that play out and we'll stop once we get to um, Gene's history. <laughs> I've angled the computer since we're doing this on my laptop. I'm Jay Edden. I'm a writer and editor, and I co-host the podcast Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men. I re Now, these guys, um, uh, it's tough because they are the heavyweights in the, as far as the commentary on the X-Men. They've gone through every book. They possibly read every book, and their podcast is, is very humorous. It's very funny. There's some bits I always go through and have issue, and I I um I think I did comment on one of the Madeline Pryor things, and they have great interviews. They have Chris Claremont, and they also have um Louise Simonson, the two that I've listened to so far. I think there's some other ones, but it's a great podcast, I have to say. And these guys have to be the heavyweight. This heavyweights as far as X Men commentary. And let's move on. I remember reading Claremont's X Men run for the first time as, as a teenager. It was big. It was an incredibly good story. The cover was pretty intriguing. You can see this female looking like unstoppable and kind of like empowered. I remember as a kid, like the covers of comic books always make it look like, oh no, this character's gonna die for sure. And then it wouldn't happen. Dark Phoenix was definitely one of those stories that it, it didn't feel like it was a stunt. This story felt like it mattered, like we're really doing this. So I wanna also say that um, <laughs> as much as it'd be nice for the for sci-fi to anoint the spinner rack, these guys are funny. This is it's a very good um, thing. You should watch it without my commentary. But I'm just I should start zipping through this. So let's keep going. Let's go to the when they go to their history. Oh, she's just like a hot redhead for nerd boys to love. She's the Stanley '60s girl, which is to say that her main personality is girl. So the 60s, the Silver Age, would have been very, very shortly after the creation of the Comics Code Authority, which is a self-governing body within comics. And there were limits specifically on the extent to which women could be threatened or involved in physical altercations. The highest selling comics in America had been romance comics. And so when they were writing a woman into superhero teams or writing female characters into superhero teams, a lot of the time they got slotted into that romance role. Comics have come a long way in their depictions of women. And then very quickly it becomes, oh, Jean fainted again. She's a tenant. Okay. 
Now, there is a little of this in there, but Jean is fairly in, she is a Stanley and Jack Kirby um, female, but at the same time, she is equal to the X-Men. She um, is very much part of the team. She isn't necessarily Sue Storm. You know, because there's other aspects of her powers. Because Angel also is a um, gets kidnapped almost as equal amount as Jean does. And late in the run, she actually leaves the team to go to college. So a college outside of the school. And the team is very much affected by this. This really affects how they um, interact. And later in the book, when they, Professor Xavier passes... Her and Cyclops become a team even before the romance starts. And, um, she, I mean, she is, she has the girl dialogue. She's struggling with Cyclops being aloof because of his eyesight. But, um, you know, there's other aspects that's a little different than the Wasp and the Invisible Girl that gives Jean just a little more spunk. And then later, because I want to show you something in this video that they have that kind of skips over what happened. So why... The fans would not just look at her as just your average girlfriend. Like, why so many? She was so loved by everybody. So, there's a key point that's missing. And seemed to be kind of the weak one. She passes out a lot. It's too much to bear. And then she just she faints and she's useless. Dan Lee kind of like lets this book, X-Men, go to the side. It's not really doing well. It's probably the worst selling book that Marvel's got for a minute. You've got Lem Ween. Wait. How did we get to the giant size X Men? So why would they decide to do a giant size X Men if the X Men are not selling? Why would you just decide? You know what? We need to do international mutants, and this will save the book. Why would they continue going on with the book at this point? Ultimately, what happened is what is missing from this story: the fact that Neil Adams comes to Marvel after doing DC books and decides he wants to try his hand at Marvel and experience the Marvel method. Now, we're not going to get into the current controversy, but um, Neil's Jean has a lot more spunk to her. She In the first issue, everyone really gets some dynamic stuff, but Jean's might be, she uses her telepathic power. Now, remember, Fez Xavier, before he passed, passed on some of his telepathic power to Jean. So she was covering that angle of the team. And she has a scene where she connects everyone to, you know, to Angel because Angel's traveling and they're just in awe of her at that point. And he made her her um, telekinetic powers a little more dynamic. And then he also had in the last issue, not the last issue, the the second to last issue he did, Jean actually fights against Magneto using the other teammates' powers because they're enthralled by um, Vertigo. Like this character called Vertigo, so they, since they're enthralled by her, Jean is still there, and she's able to fight back, and she ultimately stops Magneto, who's running out of power, and ultimately he's sitting to, to awaiting his death, and the X Men are saved. So, when what they what they're gonna be introduced in the second part of this is the fact that the sales of this they didn't get the numbers to way later. They get the numbers. They're like, wow, you know, maybe we should have let this go on. Maybe we shouldn't have dragged Neil off this book. So there was always this possible interest. They kept the title going to at some point relaunch. And when they relaunched, they decided, let's, you know, let's do, as they say, they, they, I think they said it on Sci-Fi, that let's do um, International Mutants. But you have to have the Neil Adams run to get to this because a lot of their stories, which would be, the Sentinels, the Savage Land, Sauron, and then you also have their first really cosmic caper. All these elements were very much, um, have been seen in X-Men stories going to the present day. And this was, um, Chris Claremont was very much a big fan of this. And he was also, um, I think it was at Marvel in the 70s, I think he's taking credit for one of the aspects in the Neil Lab story, but I think he was credited for an Avengers story. But um, he's seeing those things, and he was very much, you know, in awe of the Neil Adams work. 
And he's also the author of um, the Fantastic Four. But we'll get into that later. Let's quick. Let's go back. Comes in and he does this book called Giant Size X Men Number One. So Giant Size X Men Number One was a major, major shift for the title in a lot of ways. They got rid of some old characters. They brought in a lot of new characters. So, it- so before we get into this, this seems like a good thing. But for X Men fans, X Men had cult fans, not a large set of fans. And I think Terry Austin was one of them. I think also John Byrne was a a big fan of the originals. This was kind of shocking, but I think Byrne was very much a fan of Cockrum. So, and as many people. So if you weren't with the X-Men as far as them getting rid of the originals, you kind of liked Cockrum's art. So... Um, let's keep going. I might have to speed through again. So you've got Storm, who's from Kenya, Banshee, who's Irish, Logan, who's Canadian, Colossus, who's Russian. Like, you've, you've got this team of international heroes who are fighting for a world that fears change. And then Chris Claremont comes. Claremont was going to go on to write X-Men and to really define the entire X-Line for the next 17 years. He was an incredible long game writer. You're going to see bits of, of even later plot lines that he's starting to lay in just from the very beginning of his run. Now, sorry I had to break it here, only because the X-Men, when he gets on there, is a freight train. He's very much impressed, um, inspired by... The Neil Adams run, and then just Stan Lee and Jack Kirby's Fantastic Four. And he also brings back Havoc. There's a lot of things that's happening, but it's just a freight train of him distilling what's in the Fantastic Four and Neil Adams run with Dave Cockrum. And they basically, it's, it was this exciting story of globe trotting and crazy stuff. Globetrotting adventure. You don't really get to see too much. There's a little bit of people bothered with mutants. But there's not much mutant stories because they're just like, you know, they fight, can't fight Count Nefaria and Animan. I think the first, you know, they had, no, they have Stephen Lang, which is going to talk about later. But the first set of stories is just very action packed up until they get to 98. But He gave female characters interiority and relationships that weren't built around the men around them. The Phoenix Saga proper begins with issue 98. They're out in space, the X-Men. Kidnapped by Stephen Lang. He's up on a space station and he really hates mutants. He's a dick. One of the first things Gene says is, oh, hello, Lang. I didn't recognize you without your swastika. You barely look dressed without it. She's like just strung up and just like bad mouthing this dude. It's great. Now, um, Dave Cockrum also updated um not only before the phoenix updated her telekinetic power and it looked very visual so even though cyclops later in the run says she was the weakest x-men there's no real proof that she was actually the weakest x-men and um i don't know if the fans necessarily thought or saw as that but you know ultimately she's the girl of the group and they went to the weakest but this this portion here where she's stuck with um banshee and wolverine um, it's still a part of this very exciting run. They fight, they win, they're gonna get away, but the ship is messed up. They're gonna die on re-entry because there's a big, there's like a sonic space field wave. And it's impossible for whoever is flying the ship to also survive re-entry to Earth. And the person who's gonna like pilot it is going to die. Jean may be the most powerful and the only one who can save the day. That's a hard spot to be in. Jean is like, yeah, I'm gonna do it. You can't, you don't know how to fly. And so she's like, I do now. She like pulls pilot knowledge out of someone else's brain. And Scott's like, no, baby, you can't do this. You can't withstand it. And she's like, I must, Scott, I'm the only one. And then Cyclops is like, no, you're my love. I love you. Knocks Scott out. And then Storm and Wolverine are like, Jean, no, we love you. No. Wolverine does not say he loves her. He's a, a cocky SOB. And he's like, come on, you can't do this. And basically, Jean tells him off. Says she tried to like you, but the the retcons are creeping in. Where they change it to Jean being in love with Wolverine. So, let's, Wolverine was not at that point where he's expressing feelings. So, let's not go there. Oh, don't do it, don't do it. She's like, if you love me, you'll let me love you back and save you. And she... Oh, see right there? Look how visual that power is. 
Like, look at what Dave Crockham added to, added to her power. So, like, yeah, Phoenix is great, but look, they had already bumped her up, and she is a little much, even more of a go-getter under their run. And she's only been in, what, I think three issues back in the original. And they also, side note, Cockrum allowed the first kiss between Jean and, um, and Cyclops. Because I think in the original book, they were playing Cyclops more as a handicap, so they weren't even trying to go next to the physicality with the glasses and the eye beam, so um let it roll he's using her telekinetic abilities to like keep the spaceship held together how i don't know this is what you can she has telekinetic powers and she's using it but it's uh oh maybe it's it's really wacky that her powers i i get the part of her using her her um her using the mental knowledge but the telepath, the telekinetic powers to either hold together the ship or stop against the radiation. I don't know how it would stop against any of the solar radiation, but that is neither here nor there because we all know this is a, they were actually trying to give her the cosmic grades like the Fantastic Four. That, see, you have to remember, they were very much inspired by the Fantastic Four. So it didn't matter if her powers worked or didn't because we've already seen the cosmic rays turn the Fantastic Four into um, cosmic powers, powered beings. You can feel her skin being torn apart by radiation. See, see the ta 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 ta. That's from the Fantastic Four once again. And I think she's already accepted that she's going to die, so she just pilots it. They are barreling towards Earth, plane going down into Jamaica Bay. The X Men come up one by one. They're all alive, but you realize that Jean is probably dead. And then the water starts boiling and lights up and there's steam coming up and then... No longer am I the woman you knew. I am fire and life incarnate now and forever. I am, I am Phoenix. Phoenix. Everyone's like, woo, Jean's back, but also seems incredibly different. You see her and it's like a completely different outfit. It's a quick costume change. Let's not ask her where she got the costume from. Okay, this is what a lot of people ask in the letter pages. They Well, I don't know if they got I think some of the letters said it. I'm not sure if it's printed. But there was question about what, where did this phoenix come from? Why did she give herself a name and get the costume? I think that was something um, John Byrne mentioned. That there was a lot of questions about this stuff and got a lot of ribbing about like where did this stuff come from maybe that was in the office i can't remember but um someone said it but i'm glad this part i like uh, i like that it's you know it's um you know they, we also have a young person in here talking about comic books so i'm always a fan of that so i'm still enjoying it i still like this video this is already weird already. They're having another space adventure. Imagine like if you could take like the entire Infinity Gauntlet and just make it like a big ass rock. And it is a nexus of all realities. And if it is destroyed, basically it turns into a black hole and sucks up all the realities into the black hole. And they fall into the center of the crystal. Jean notices that the crystal is cracked and fractured and it's hurting. She basically in that moment takes the universe and solders it back together. Now, she does do that, but she says, I don't have enough power. So she uses the X-Men as anchors and somehow that allows her, helps her to finish the job. So, and this was the big issue between Byrne and Claremont. And ultimately we know that the X-Men and their powers really didn't help her. This is as everyone else is saying. Um, they just came up with a way to include the X-Men. This is basically a Phoenix scene. And this is the crux of the problem with the Phoenix is that you don't need the X-Men when she's that powerful. And she's not really joined back with the team. She's still living with Misty Knight, you know, doing whatever she was doing. She was just on a date and she got dragged out and now she's Phoenix. So let's not forget that. So, um, do I want to skip ahead? Cause they talk about, they talk about, um, 
let's get to Jason Winder because basically some of the other bits that happen in between here are um, are some things that we didn't understand. There's more behind the scenes. So let's sort of go to the Hellfire Club. Scott Summers. Scott is very frightened of his girlfriend, but also very in love with his girlfriend. And Scott cries a lot. I mean, his power is pretty cool, but her power is like, she's a god. I'm gonna let you take off your visor. He's like, no, no, you can't do that. It'll be out of control, it'll destroy everything. She's like, no, no, I will control it for you. She makes it so that Scott can remove his Ruby Quartz glasses so she can look at his face. Then at that moment, he kind of realized Jean's true abilities. It's her way. Well, one of the things you have to say well, that um, when Jean does that, that's after she's getting more and more powerful. This is clearly when she's well, the events they're going to talk about later, but she doesn't. She doesn't know she's that powerful yet. She doesn't know she's pretty powerful. That comes later when the events they talk about now come into play. And of course, if a woman is going to be exceptional in any way, some dude somewhere has to make it about his. Day. Here's a fun fact: if you're a telepath. People are up in your sh constantly. Mastermind is a guy named Jason Wingard. He is an illusionist. He's got some telepathic abilities, and he is a huge creep. Jason Wingard can make you think that you are Beyonce. Well, he cannot make you think you're Beyonce. He's not actually Jason Wingard. Mastermind is an illusionist. Um, that's basically his power. He's not able to, there's some hints that he could possibly change voices, but there's nothing been really figured out. This story has a subplot because Jason Wingard has all these powers. He's able to do all this stuff, but ultimately we find out middle of the run of this story, which is like, well, Jason Wingard is in there since uh, I think it's X-Men... Um, 122, and he doesn't necessarily. Yeah, I guess he he meets. When does Cyclops meet him? I don't think. I think he meets him way later. He meets him like 132. He meets Jason Wingard. So he just thinks he's a rival for Gene's affections. So Mastermind. We don't know he's Mastermind. We don't find him through 132, and Mastermind is way more powerful than he ever was. And it's not just <laughs> um, Claremont and Byrne deciding, you know what, let's bump up his power. Like, Byrne isn't really one to change the power. So ultimately, there's a telepath on the Hellfire Club. And he sort of finds a way to project his illusions in her head. So we have to remember that, yes, this looks like they bumped up Mastermind's power. But there was always a telepath there. With a lot of technology, they always did stuff so that he's projecting it into her mind. And that's um that's how he does it. It's not because he's a telepath. He's not he's in no way telepathic. Nothing that later on, I think Scott Lobdell played him as a telepath and he could create a whole world. But ultimately he's just an illusionist. There's some extent that it could um it could um there's some extent that it can, you know, like there's some, it can push the limits. I think Chris Claremont pushed it further later on. But at this point, he's just a, uh, he's just an illusionist with a mind tap, which allows him to put it into Jean's mind, into her telepathic mind. Because none of, the, none of the other illusions are working that way. They only work this way through Jean's mind. No one else is seeing this stuff. And it's only affecting Jean friends and only Beyonce is Beyonce. He decides that he's gonna mind control her by extending her back into these flashbacks that look like romance novel covers. Him and the Hellfire Club want to control her and the Phoenix Force for their own gains towards world domination. The Hellfire Club is an organization of the CD elite who run the world. Whose whole thing seems to be some kinky role play based around anachronistic 18th century fashion. Marvel. Now, this is 
shamelessly grab from the Avengers TV show, The British Avengers of Steed and Peel. You had to say that's where Chris Claremont was. It saw Bernard also saw it, so they shamelessly pulled as much as they could from that. And Jason Weingart is a, a based on the an actor. I think it's Peter Weingart, and he looks exactly like Jason Weingart, except that um, Weingart kind of looks like a cross between Mastermind and Jason Weingart because he's very thin. Well, is a is his family entertainment. So the things they would actually be doing where they wear like beaky masks, everybody's like rubbing on everybody else. You can't even hint at. Fundamentally, they're just they're a bunch of doofuses. I just imagine that they have like, always have a buffet in there of some kind. It's fam- now, before we leave there, because basically with Burn not there, these guys kind of fell out because they didn't really have a costume and they kind of, you know... They kind of fell from favor without someone to highlight how they could possibly beat the X-Men. But, you know, they were solid. And this story is key because this is one of the bits that um, in one of the side panels in the last issue of the Hellfire Club fight, we are introduced. We see a small panel of small character that could look like a character that's going to appear in the Days of Future Past. A senator is here at this thing and in issue 135 that senator appears and says something happened wolverine of course did something to one of the hellfire club as payback and he's going to the hospital and then senator kelly says he sees this happen he knows that wolverine cut this person and so senator kelly's fears about mutants comes because he doesn't know that the X-Men are heroes. He thinks they're outlaws and because they attack this, especially this club. So this is the almost perfect setup to re- re-set up feared and hated by the world that's sworn to protect. Because Senator Kelly is seeing this and he's thinking that the X-Men are totally bad. So I just want to get in this bit that this thing has one of the simple, like a little bit of self subplot set up for the um, next story. So. And see, but also like low quality, like it's tablecloths, but like weird, gross snacks. Let's go take down these rich creeps. And as soon as they're there, find control she's experiencing and just get really angry. Now, at this point, I'm just skipping ahead to the ending where Jean breaks free. Because uh, everything else they did good. Everything else is solid. There's nothing to add. And there's no bits to add. Everything here is solid. The only thing is um, when they get to the... No, I don't think the, ne- the next bit is, is pretty decent, too. But um, this is about Jean affecting Jason Weingart. Immediately doing her I am fire, I am destruction thing. And she like corners Wingard. And pretty much funnels open his brain and pours it. Now let's move ahead to the big portion because this is this is going to be debated forever. She's hungry. And she heads out to space and feeds off a star. Flies into the center of it and just absorbs it all. I relate to this because I will sometimes uh, buy things in the grocery store when I'm hungry. And I think that I'm going to eat them over a, a reasonable period of time. And then I'll eat all of it. Unfortunately, this is a star that is orbited by a number of planets, one of which is populated. They show like a, a quick glimpse of, of them. They're like these weird asparagus looking people. And without their son, they, they die. She just killed an entire solar system. Behind the scenes, Jim Shooter and some of the other folks um, that were working at Marvel at the time were pissed off um, that Gene had committed genocide, even though it was asparagian genocide. This was actually kind of an accident. Uh, the original script, Claremont just had it destroying the planet, uh, burned drew people in some of the panels. They were really mad about it. Now, wait a second. This has been documented many times over. It's been kind of, you know, but basically, Byrne and Claremont worked over the phone. So, yes, in the plot that they talked over, 
that um, Gene would eat a star. But as someone asked on AOL, I have it somewhere. I'm pretty sure I can't find it. They say, why did why did Gene have to eat? You know, destroy that planet with the people on it. And ultimately, the plan was that Gene was supposed was sorry. Gene was supposed to become a villain. So what their original plan was, Gene goes bad and becomes a reoccurring villain. This was approved by Jim Shooter. At that time, what they came up with, she destroys the star, she gets attacked, she kills some of this, this Shire ship. Ultimately, that's not really her going bad. That goes, I must, I must not thing. And ultimately, Byrne gave them a reason. Now, Burn, this is this issue is sent in. It's not sent in in hiding. Burn is not a um, editor of the book. It gets sent in. I think it was approved by um, Salakrup. Uh, Jim Salakrup approves it. Jim Lee, uh, no, sorry, not Jim Lee. Jim Shooter either didn't see it, or no, he says he saw it, and he's like, okay, let's see how. The, Let's see how they played out. He says this in um, Phoenix the Untold story. He, you know, ultimately gets to the end of the story and he's like, he's not happy. But they weren't, no one, it's not until they get to 137, 135, they're not flipping out. They're like, wow, they're up in the ante. Remember, Chris Claremont is not bothered with this. He wrote, he wrote to the panel. So he could have said, no, I don't, don't do this. Anyone could have said at that point before. Burton added that, yes, but they weren't mad. So let's keep moving. It's not until after where Jim Shooter said, well, this happened. This has to happen then. I thought that was a story they didn't want to do. One of the coolest things that has ever happened in comic book history, we saw one of our most loved heroes go full villain. Dark Phoenix is feeling great, though. She she got her lunch. This kills all these aliens, and she's feeling great about it. But now the aliens are outraged. She's committed this huge intergalactic war crime. On her way back to Earth, she also encounters a Shi'ar worship. And she destroys them. Like, that. That puts her on the radar of the Shi'ar Empire, and they head to Earth to deal with what's going on, because they recognize the Phoenix Force. The Phoenix Force is something nicknamed Chaos Brick. Did it again. That puts her on the radar of the Shi'ar Empire, and they head to Earth to deal with what's going on because they recognize the Phoenix Force. The Phoenix Force is something nicknamed Chaos Bringer. Okay, it's a little more than that. It's not a nickname. Basically, she's the Dark Angel. Phoenix is the Dark, known to the Shire by the Dark Angel, the Chaos Bringer. Ravenger of Worlds, meaning this is an, and they say call it an entity. So this means it's an entity that they knew of. And this is this dark character that Gene has become. So they're saying to you that it's an entity. They're saying it's a creature of legend. They got, it's got three names and a description. Like two, you know, Phoenix, the Dark Angel, Chaos Bringer, Ravenger of Worlds. So... And this is some of the things we forget when every time we say Gene has to die and someone brings back a Phoenix character. We're going to the end of it because a lot of things happen. We're getting, you have to watch this video. I'm not giving you everything. I'm just giving you the bits you missed. And you go back and you can add the rest of those bits to it. So he says uh, he's wrestling with this. And then all of a sudden, like uh, he gets a room service, like a, a masseuse comes in. He's like, oh boy. Behind the scenes, there's this conversation, right? What are we gonna do with Jean Grey? There was this idea that Jim Shooter had, which was that she would become imprisoned for all time. Chris Claremont was like, I can't do that because then the whole rest of the story for the X-Men until that changes is gonna be them trying to get her back 24 seven. That's all they're gonna be on. One of the- Now, there's another thing here. It's not until you get to the end. They sent in the story they did. You saw the pencil that they had there. They sent in the story, and and Jim Shooter rejected it. He said it wasn't. He was like, if there had to be some punishment for what she did, not her go back home. And Bernie Claremont upset. 
Not because Byrne added a scene that was unapproved. What happened was that their plan was her to become a reoccurring villain. That's what the story was. So they're like, basically all that story goes out. They lose the setup of having new circuit breakers. All the stuff that's set up in here is now gone because something has to happen to her. Now, Byrne and Claremont fight in Untold. Uh, um, uh, not really a real big fight, but they just go back and forth where Claremont says Roger Stern is the reason why Jean had to die. And then Byrne said, well, no, it was your final decision. And then Claremont one-ups him and says, you said to Byrne, I'm not doing this nastiness to her. I'm going to kill her. Um, there's any other bits here? This part here with the costume. Byrne is one of the guys that likes the original costume, so it's not... Defining parts of any superhero is their costume. Chris, Luis, Byrne, they all knew this moment was coming. The readers might not have known, but they knew and they wanted to pay homage. Now, <laughs> the only one, if you have a, a costume designed by Dave Cockham, same with um, the stuff that when, I don't think Chris Claremont was fighting to have the original costume back. But Byrne is a nostalgia guy. He's a big original X-Men fan. And Louise, she just got on the book. She was the editor of Warren. So, I mean, she's a strong editor, but I'm not sure she was jumping to say, put her in this costume. I mean, Byrne is the one that sort of tailored Cyclops costume and looked more like he did in, in Neil Adams time. So, I mean, this is one of those bits because, you, you know, Byrne also brings back the original costume with Kitty later. So, and I don't, I'm not sure if he, if anyone else is really jumping to get the original costumes when he got a, a Dave Cockrum costume. So I just want to add that bit there. But it's always fun to see the original costumes. And what do we want to get to here? Um, um, it's one of the things that's. Uh, I mean, everything here is covered. That you know, she makes ultimate sacrifice. It's powerful. Um, you have to, you know, watch it. So let's get to past that point. And I think there's only one bit where they talk about resurrection. The last thing that she did with her powers was destroy herself so she couldn't hurt any other innocent people. She's died so many times that I was expecting her to live, but she didn't live. This time. Okay, uh, that's one good point there. She has not died that many times. Jean comes back in 86, and it's not till after the 2000s where um, I don't think Grant Morrison decides to kill her again. So she only has two deaths in comic books, and then Phoenix comes back another time. So if you count the times that Claremont used Phoenix and almost killed Rachel as Phoenix, and then you had the cartoon that did Death of Phoenix, and then you have Last Stand that did Death of Phoenix, then you get the Dark Phoenix movie, then you have a bunch of stories where Jean keeps dying and coming back. Where this is the first story where she died. And let's listen to the, um, I might have to play this all the way through. I might stop it, but they're going to talk about the ramifications of the death. She could have solved world hunger. She could have made anything like she can rearrange molecules. She could have done so much good, but instead she was seen as a threat and had to be destroyed. And that, for a long, long time, was the end of Jean Grey. She disappeared from X-Men comics for about five and a half years. Like, a lot of readers were really... No. ...upset when they killed off Jean Grey. But to be able to take a risk really is what they were looking for at that time because it took the X-Men to another level. The X-Men weren't prior to this, right? This is the story that really puts them on the map. How do we jump? 
And then notice what happened. They showed a Jim Lee picture. We just skated by Gene. Let's go back. X-Men to another level. The X-Men weren't prior to this, right? This is the story that really puts them on the map. They, look, there's Gene in the corner. We gotta try it again. What's Gene doing back? They say, let's put her on the map, and then we got X-Men number one. So let's try this one more time. Their level. The X-Men weren't prior to this, right? This is the story that really puts them on the map. There she goes. We have regular Jean Grey. No Phoenix, right? Devoid of Phoenix. Just Jean Grey. Not even the name Marvel Girl. So, basically... I mean, from, from, um, she was brought back in X Factor, and ultimately in um, 1991, the original X Men finally got back into their original title. What was stolen and what was lost by these international immigrants that get a visa from Professor Xavier, they finally got the originals back into the title. And Gene is with them. And it would be so sorry if, you know, Scott is married to a lookalike and his daughter from the future has the Phoenix power. We we got through all that stuff. Even though there's classic X-Men explaining stuff and other stories that tie into this stuff. Ultimately, whether you dislike or not, Gene was back in the team and there's like a good 15 years of her being back in the live and stories which were selling like hotcakes. Gene is involved in the age of, of apocalypse. So let's not keep talking about her being dead and live. She was alive again. She was gone for, I guess it'd be six years. Many characters have come back. Professor Xavier has come back. So, um, I'm just happy that the originals got back in there. And I'm glad Gene was back at that same time when they hit their hugest success. Which led to the cartoon. They let Gene get into the cartoon. Cyclops, Beast, and Marvel Girl are in the animated cartoon. Basically, the show that got the X-Men into... Um, the movie theater so i'm glad they got in there they didn't get by my favorite character angel or um iceman shows up at some point i can't remember when but um we had to remember that the hardest thing i think to do is to kill a character and never bring them back and they have brought dark phoenix back but i think it's one of those things where whenever they do they usually will make the same decision that no no See, they keep saying it again. She died once. She, in 1980, she came back in 1986. She didn't die again until we get to the Grant Morrison run, which has was, plays up a lot of the cliches and not necessarily turn them on their heels. Gene just phoenixes out and, you know, we have a scene like the X-Men The Last Stand. So I don't know which came first, but... This is a scene we already saw when Wolverine had to stab Rachel. So that's the problem. I don't know if Grant Morrison had to decide to do that, but he did. He wanted to do his Phoenix story. That's what happens when you're the top guy and you get on one of the top titles. You want to get your turn. You can't bring the character back without betraying the whole point of the character, which is this character can't exist. Again, Phoenix is the problem. People still okay with Phoenix coming back or Phoenix power coming back. So Phoenix is the thing that needs to be stopped. Not, you know, I don't know. Well, that goes into something later that was retconned. So I can't talk about that now. But if you read the, the Phoenix the Untold story, at that point, Shooter listened to what Byrne and Claremont had. Now, they're still, of course, they're Byrne and Claremont, so they had two different views of what's going on, that Jean would just go home, but she wouldn't be facing what happened. And Byrne said that what they were planning was that she would be 
um, basically set back. She would be mentally deficient. And then the Phoenix would now burst out in, in not the greatest of times, causing the X-Men to now come after her because she's a recurring villain. And they talk about this, but then when they talk about it with, with Terry Austin, Terry Austin says, well, since the death is better, but Jean didn't get it. I mean, she has a sacrifice, but she didn't get the moment to be a hero. And he says, well, we got this big Magneto story. Why not get to 150 and play out the story in the end? And either she could go, you know, be powerless in the end. Or, you know, she'd die in that issue by the hands of Magneto. And Shooter, when he hears that, the whole room lights up. And they're all like, wow. And Claremont's even with it. They're all with it. So possibly they could have done it. They could have let Byrne and Claremont do what they were planning and still won out. Maybe not in issue 137, but in issue 150. But then it has nothing. Byrne left. Who knows what could have happened. Claremont did took, went totally different with Magneto. And that's a whole bunch of other stuff. But let's keep going. We're almost through this video. I think for the time that it came out, specifically for the 70s and 80s, it was something like we'd never seen before. One of the best-selling stories of all time. It, it wasn't that. But I think over time now with the trades, maybe. No, it can't be. The best-selling of all time is X-Men number one. But... That said, I want to end here. It's been fairly long, but these guys did a very great video. I enjoyed it a whole lot. You have all the heavyweights in there. You have a, a, a younger person reading comics, which is great to hear. You got to explain the X Men, Jay from Explaining the X Men. They have a comedian, and, um, you know. And lastly, here is. Burns' reinterpretation of of the Dark Phoenix saga. It's the cover of Phoenix the Untold Story. And this is in the X-Men Artist Edition that you've already seen earlier. And then here, um, what, is, what do you got going on? The interesting bit is this is only a couple years after the original story. And Byrne clearly has Jean Grey on one side and Phoenix on the other. So, not to say this is this is a symbolic cover of the X-Men fighting her, but it's interesting of seeing this being a much larger person, possibly as big as Colossus, and uh, compared to much smaller Jean here. And ultimately, the other cool part of this is it's a reunion between um, Chris Claremont, no, sorry, a reunion between Byrne and Terry Austin. And if you notice one thing, Byrne really wanted to do a Slim Summers. So we got a thin Cyclops here. We got Wolverine. So Cyclops lost about 20 pounds, possibly. Nightcrawler maybe lost maybe five. Wolverine kind of lost 10. I don't know, maybe a couple, couple pounds here. Storm didn't really lose too much pounds, but it looked like she gained muscle. And the Phoenix, now we really get to see him playing with it. So adding another bit, I don't know that was a part of the story that she was larger. Couldn't really see, but you know, we can see the style is slightly different. It's still really nice. It's a really a nice image between Byrne and, and Austin. Uh, it's one of my favorites of theirs, and uh, I know I would never be able to own the original, but this is a close second. No, this is a close first, because I never thought I'd get this, so. Um, another bit is that I believe the original of this was one, at one point was stolen, and uh, maybe three times posted Dark Phoenix Saga. Um, when Burn drew Phoenix, it was stolen. So I think this one was stolen when he drew Phoenix in She-Hulk, which was not a popular comic at the time. That image got stolen. And then later when he did The Hidden Years and did Phoenix, that one was stolen also. Okay, thank you. Bye.